This podcast and content posted by Dr. Judith Joseph is presented solely for general informational, educational, and entertainment purposes. The use of information on this podcast or materials linked from this podcast or website is at the user's own risk. It is not intended as a substitute for the advice of a physician, professional coach, psychotherapist, or other qualified professional diagnoses or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice for any medical or mental health condition they may have and should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Dr. Afia is a licensed psychologist and researcher. She leads the innovative research project, Psychotherapy, which offers training on mental health certification for hair stylists. Dr. Afia stated that most people trust their stylist more than they trust a talk therapist. So it makes sense to educate stylists on ways to support their clients' mental health and well-being. Many people don't want to be in a waiting room. They don't want to be seen in a therapist's office, no. right? But there's not going to be that stigma when you're walking into your stylist or to your barber or salon, right? Yes, no one's yes. going to be like, what, what are they doing there, right? It's all about accessibility and being culturally relevant. I do think that hair care professionals are more trusted than therapists. Dr. Afia's research has led to over 20 peer-reviewed journal articles, two books, and she has presented her groundbreaking research to over 40 universities and conferences. She is an expert who has advised Senate and the House of Representatives with regards to anti-discrimination laws related to the Crown Act. Dr. Afia is not only an Ivy League and HBCU educated therapist, she is also a natural hairstylist and loves creating art with locks, twists, and afros. She joins us in the vault to discuss the connection between hair, beauty, and mental health. Dr. Fia helped me to trace my origin hair story so that I could personally understand how my hair impacts my mood and self-image. I was impressed by what she uncovered, and I know that you will love this episode of The Vault because it is fascinating. Dr. Fia, thank you so much for being on my podcast. I'm super excited to be here right now with you. I'm a huge fan. <laughs> I am a huge fan. So I feel like we're gushing over each other. Yes. I just think it's so brilliant what you're doing, connecting hair to mental health, because it's all, you know, a part of self-care. But also many of us don't have access to therapists. And when we feel the most seen and heard and relaxed is when we're in that chair with our stylist, with our barber. So I, I just think what you're doing is so brilliant. Please tell me about how you thought of this and about what you do. Okay. Well, I've always loved doing hair. I was my family's hairstylist. I actually would have a lawn chair set up in my aunt's backyard at family reunions and cookouts and braid and style my relative's hair. And so this translated to my college dorm room. So I went to the University of Pennsylvania undergrad and it's a predominantly white institution. And so my particular dorm room was a hair salon that people were coming in and out getting all types of styles, whether it was a football player for the big game or someone was going on a, a date with someone new. I was doing hair and I knew all the tea. Like I knew <laughs> everything that was happening on that campus with the black students. And so the conversations were amazing. I also was a psychology major. I think, you know, it leaned into that conversational piece. And I remember talking to to my aunt Brenda on the phone one day and telling her I didn't know what I wanted to do after I graduated. Should I study psychology or hair? And she said, well, why can't you do both? And it just was this connecting point for me where there is a huge intersection between mental health and hair care. And so that's what I ended up doing. I went on to then study clinical psychology at Howard University and got my master's and PhD. And then I went to hair school. Wow. So it was kind of a unique journey where I was going between my therapy office and the shampoo bowl and seeing how much of the same skills were being applied. What are some of those skills? Well, the number one thing is active listening. I think that was the hardest skill I ever had to learn as a therapist and as a hairstylist to really come up with a shared understanding, right? Just having really clear and active communication. And I, I think a mistake, I'm, I'm not trying to hate on hairstylists, sometimes they give too much advice without listening first. And so I think that that's a big part in terms of the process, really being an excellent and practicing that. <laughs> <laughs> I think that as a stylist, I mean, I'm I'm not a stylist, but I know that when you're used to working with your hands, you want to do, right? You want to just do, 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 do. I used to be an anesthesiologist mm. before I saw the light and left that and went to what? psychiatry. Wow. And that's okay. all about doing. You're like putting things into people and... <laughs> 
but they're not talking, right? So there's <laughs> not a lot of be. listening. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I think people feel like they have to do. And there's such a value in listening. And one of my friends and colleagues, Dr. Jen Harstein, will say, to parents, put your hands under your, your legs, mm. do nothing, just listen. And that's the hardest thing you can do. So, so I love that. What is active listening? Okay. Active listening is basically giving someone the receipts that you are listening to them because you can summarize, paraphrase, be curious with them in terms of what they just said. Sometimes people need to hear back what they just said to make sure that there was like an exchange of information. So that's active listening, not only with the words that someone's saying, but the feelings, right? Listening to the feelings and the content and paying attention to body language. Sometimes we think listening is just about sound, but listening is definitely connected to body language. About 70% of how we communicate is through body language. Absolutely. And also, you know, when you are observing people, right? you are mostly listening. Yes. As in our field, we know like the, the mental status exam, which is a part of our note, it's all about observation. So it's less about what we're saying, but what we're observing. And stylists can probably get this. I know my stylist, when she goes through my hair, she's like, okay, you're stressed yes. or you're not taking care of this and you're not taking, they're observing. So observation is a part of listening. Exactly. Exactly. And and it's a skill that not everyone has. And so it takes a lot of practice and supervision yeah. to become a great active listener. So tell me about the certification that you offer and how, you know, how people can get it, how they can obtain it, learn more about it. Okay. So I developed the psychotherapy certification. It is a 12-hour certification process that's divided into three modules. The first part is getting into the history of our hair. I think history is so important, right? In mental health, we talk about the best predictor for future behavior is past behavior. And so to really understand the history of our hair and how much it's connected to healing rituals. So I think that's people's favorite part. It's like, I'm, I'm taking them on a time machine of like thousands of years of hair history. And then the second module is focused on signs and symptoms of mental illness in communities of color in terms of understanding how depression might look a little bit different on black women, maybe in comparison to white men, and just noticing those differences. And sometimes there's a misdiagnosis that happens and demystifying those things. And then the third part is the psychotherapy skills, which is really focusing on micro counseling skills, being able to assess for harm, doing the active listening, sharing insights, and even how to make referrals to resources and to professional mental health workers in terms of really going into what it's like to have someone sit in your chair who's having a panic attack, who just experienced a death in their family and really going over techniques. I give a script to the people who are certified because a big thing that people say is, I don't know what I'm supposed to say. And so I teach them, sometimes that could be the thing to say in terms of, I don't have the words right now, but just know that I'm here and I'm listening and how healing that could be. So we go through role plays and practice in that third module to make sure it's really applied. I love it because you're incorporating the mental health first aid into a culturally competent context, yes. which is, I think, easier for people to accept. Hmm. And let's be real. Not only do people not have access to therapists, many people don't want to be in a waiting room. They don't want to be seen in a therapist's office, no. right? <laughs> but there's not going to be that stigma when you're walking into your stylist mm -hmm. or to your barber or salon, right? No one's going to be like, what, what are they doing there, right? So it is really a way to make mental health support and uh, resources available to more people. Yes, yes. It's all about accessibility and being culturally relevant. I do think that hair care professionals are more trusted than therapists in a lot of communities. And so leaning into hair care professionals being those lay health advisors. Because it's a positive experience. Yes. You know, there's nothing wrong with you. You're going for upkeep versus I think many people view therapy as there's got to be a problem, right? But we need to shift that because many of us, we don't. We shouldn't be in therapy when there's a crisis, right? When we're stressed, we can't really, you know, take in all that information and use it to the best of our ability. The brain that's stressed out does not learn that well. Mm -hmm. But if we maintain our mental health, you know, along the way, 
then when we are in crisis or in stress mode, we can pull on the things that we learned when we were relaxed, when we were not stressed out, right? <laughs> exactly. That That's like the root of systematic desensitization mm-hmm. in terms of really getting to that state of relaxation versus that anxious feeling to be able to soothe yourself and calm down. I recently started practicing meditation. I, don't, I didn't know what meditation was, but even getting into a daily practice that when something stressful happens... I'm able to like focus on my breath and go inward and ground myself to be able to process, right? Because when you're feeling anxious, two things happen. You're so focused on anxiety, but you can't resolve the problem. And so to soothe yourself, you can actually focus on finding solutions for the problem. Absolutely right. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you do is you teach history and you teach about how certain things that are experienced within certain communities can negatively impact, you know, the way that you feel about yourself. And one of those things being hair. For Black populations, hair has notoriously been something that has either held us back or helped us, depending on how you see it. I know personally, as being someone with who is multicultural, my mom's Indian, my dad's Black, and it was moving to this country from Trinidad, it was like a big topic, right? Like growing up, are you are you Black? Or like, are you Jamaican? And it's like, no, I'm from Trinidad. And it's like, okay, but why is your hair like this? And for me, even at a young age, my hair was a source of stress Mm -hmm. because either I wasn't black enough or it wasn't straight enough. Mm -hmm. So I think that when we acknowledge how this plays a role into our emotional well-being and development, that's the first step. But tell me about some of the things that you've learned during your research Mm -hmm. about the history of hair. I know it's like, it's a, it's a really loaded question (laughs) because there are probably like chapters and books, right? But some of the more more fascinating things that you, that people are almost like, oh my gosh, that's so interesting. Mm. Well, I think that there are so many rituals connected to hair. So a ritual is how you prepare your mind, body, and spirit to receive something. And so I found myself studying a lot of traditional African hair rituals Mm -hmm. because there are thousands and thousands of years old. And with that, it's understanding that hair is a complex language system. It can tell so much information about someone, where they're from, who their family is, their spiritual beliefs, maybe even their profession, all of that. And so I think that a big part of my research is understanding that language of hair and what can be revealed about someone's identity. Even thinking about the rituals in West Africa from birth, there are baby naming ceremonies that a baby's head will be shaved seven to 10 days after they're born as a the hair being a sacrifice to the spiritual realm for the safety of this child. There are hairstyles that you can only wear after being initiated through a rites of passage program, certain wedding hairstyles, e- even death hairstyles. I think it's one of the interesting facts. Historically, throughout the African diaspora, people tend to shave or cut their hair related to a breakup, divorce, or a death. And so the, there's this huge shift in identity as marked through shifts in their hair. And it's an invitation to offer someone care. So even in that head shaving ritual or not even combing your hair is a suggestion. I need help. I need care. Pay attention to me. And so even how that's connected to like wellness and rituals and community involves mental health care. So it's some really interesting stuff. My lab has been around for 10 <laughs> years. We uh, founded it in 2014 at Howard University. So we have a good like 25 peer reviewed journal articles, maybe like a dozen book chapters and even some books coming out. So there's, I'm trying to summarize a <laughs> lot of content and words in this. Well, I'm sure in your research, you've seen how what you see or observe in someone's hair and their hair health can tell you a lot about what's happening on the inside, oh, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Our hair is a litmus test for what's going on inside of our bodies. It can tell how much water you're drinking, how much exercise, if you're eating healthy, if you're getting enough sleep, all of that can be understood and assessed through hair. Well, I once had a patient who would keep their hoodie on all mm-hmm. the time. And I, you know, everyone who saw the patient, adolescent patient, you know, the the teachers would say, oh, it's because of social anxiety. Oh, it's because of shyness or it's because of this and that. It turned out that the person didn't like their hair. Nobody, nobody thought of asking them. And I think I've had a couple of dermatologists on on the show, and I think people think of things like this as vanity, but it's not, you know, like your face, your outer, that's the first thing people see. And that's the first thing, unfortunately, people judge, right? So it can impact the way you feel about yourself. So 
what are some of the things where people do have issues around their hair and you've seen it, that connected to their mental health, their sense of self-worth mm-hmm. and so forth? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I think hair is a part of our body image, right? I think a lot of the existing psychological literature on body image, especially for women, is about weight. But I think that hair, especially for women of the African diaspora, it's more important than weight. And so one thing that stands out is about hair loss. So Dr. Yolanda Lenzi, a cosmetologist and dermatologist, she found that 47% of Black women will experience some form of hair loss in their lifetime, 47%. And so to think about, they actually have to go through a grief process in terms of maybe the initial shock or denial and going through phases of maybe sadness or anger until they arrive to that acceptance phase. But I think that that would even address this. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we see conditions like alopecia, even hair thinning related to depression, mm-hmm. sometimes trichotillomania related to like anxiety conditions yes. where you're pulling at your hair. Sometimes people don't even know they're doing it, right? They're, they're asleep. They're having a bad dream. They're pulling. So they're like, I'm waking up and I have this hair all over the place. And they don't even realize that it's due to anxiety. So your hair can really tell you a lot, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And I I think there's such thing as hair depression Mm -hmm. in terms of it's twofold. Hair depression can be when you're so depressed that you don't get to take care of your hair just is something you're neglecting. But also hair depression could be when you really want to get your hair done, but you can't. Maybe you can't afford it, don't have the time or access or means and just not feeling good about how you look. So I think this probably should be added to the DSM in terms of being more culturally sensitive and inclusive in terms of how it can actually shift someone's mood. Their hair can actually alter um, their emotional state. Absolutely. I think a lot of things need to be corrected. (laughs) But that's why it's important to have research. Yes. Especially from people who are women of color, who are diverse, because then you have a a huge body of research that does not include information from populations, right? We can't... uh, are kept out of the research. So we need principal investigators like you. Yeah, yes, you right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I actually am, just had a chapter published in a book about Black girls and women's health that says we've totally been left out of these like really important clinical studies and even philosophies of science where our ways of knowing are not included, whether it's intuition or just being emotionally sensitive to things that are outside of a research lab too. Absolutely. Things like if someone comes in with a different hairstyle every week, it's not necessarily indicative of a mood disorder. It just could be culturally that that's what somebody does because it's a part of their community. Yes. It makes them feel good, right? Yes, yes. It's nothing to do with their identity or the identity diffusion, right? <laughs> Things like that need to be talked about, right? Yes, yes. Well, it's interesting because hair is the most easily manipulated part of our bodies that we can change it day to day. We can't change our weight day to day. We can't change maybe our skin color day to day or our facial features. But if you wanted to, you can change your hair on a daily basis. Oh, yeah, correct. It's one of the things that you can change. Mm-hmm. Tell us about some of your research, because how did this happen? How did you get fun- grants? How did you get funding? <laughs> how do you think of your, your hypotheses and, and your thesis? Okay. <laughs> That's All a lot. right. I feel like I'm doing my <laughs> dissertation defense. All right. Bring me back to 2010. <laughs> so it's interesting because I would always talk about this connection between hair and mental health, but in academia, they're like, where is your evidence? Right. I'm like, I know there is a connection. And so I had to develop a whole research lab that saw these connections. And so initially we were using internet-based data to be able to draw certain conclusions. So one study that we did very early on was studying YouTube hair tutorials to see about what were some of the themes that were being discussed for different hair textures. And we recognized for natural hair, whether I don't like to use the hair typing system all the time, but 3C to 4C and even comparing um, the health conversations that were happening during a tutorial on how to do your hair, make sure to drink your water, get sleep, that they were actually instructing people on health care behaviors, journaling during <laughs> a hair care tutorial. Um, another thing we looked at was magazine covers. So one of the studies was on Ebony Magazine, which is the longest running black publication. And we studied how did hair trends 
shift from like the 1950s to present and even noticing like patterns and length and texture and style to see this sort of visual narrative of hair. So we started kind of with existing things and didn't collect data just to see what everybody else was talking about. But then in 2017, I developed something called the Hair Health and Heritage Study. And so I had my research students go out to, I think it was 95 hair salons in the Washington D. DC metropolitan area and collect data from people while they were getting their hair done. So that it was a link so that they could fill it out on their phone, but answering questions about their hair in terms of how they styled it, how they care for it, whether they had a perm, whether they didn't, all these different things, how often they cut it, their hair, their health. So they answered questions, not only about their physical health, how many fruits and vegetables do they eat or how much water are they drinking, how much of the exercise, but also we had measures about depression and anxiety and other things like that. And then the heritage part of the study, <laughs> we had people complete surveys on racial identity, ethnic identity, to understand how all of these things fit together. How does their hair influence their health, which influences their heritage or vice versa and finding out all these different patterns. So I've been publishing out of that data set wow. for a few years because it was so rich. I think we had about 500 participants, but looking at some of the stories that they told, I specifically developed the guided hair autobiography. Wow. And so the, this was something that I piloted through that study where people would tell their earliest memory of their hair, low point, like the worst thing that ever happened to them in their hair and a turning point, like something that made them shift and how they saw themselves in their hair. So we have all these stories, all this data that we've been mining for years to be able to publish through. But, but it makes me think, what, what what's your early, now I'm looking, <laughs> what's your earliest hair memory? Do you have like an early childhood oh, hair yes, memory? Oh yes, I do. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> so for some reason, when I was younger, I have all of my sisters, I have two sisters, so th three, the three Joseph girls, I had the shortest hair mm -hmm. and my mother would do these like ringlets with my sister. So they would have these like cute little pigtails. And when we went to church, because my dad was a pastor, we go to church and everyone would be like, look at those curls. And my sisters would be like this. And then I'd be like, <laughs> with my, like sticking out like that. <laughs> but then now I have the most hair. So go figure, right? <laughs> like it just like when I hit puberty, it was like, I couldn't mm, get rid of it. it my hair has exploded and I went through periods where like I had so much hair that it was it was harder for me to wear my hair naturally curly which mm -hmm. is very beautiful I love my curls but it's harder to maintain it yes. than to go straight so I get a lot of um, people DMing me I would love to see your curls I would love to see my <laughs> curls too but <laughs> but that means I have to get up an hour earlier let it dry because you can't let it dry a certain way or else it's like hard to you know it's a lot of product it's a lot more work for me mm -hmm. at least to be curly and natural than to just have it blown out and then keep it in a bun because I don't look like this when I'm in the lab. <laughs> oh, it's in a bun. This is not your everyday no, look. I wear scrubs. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was my earliest memory was yeah. like, oh, like, well, my sisters have these cute little ringlets and everyone's like, oh, how cute. What happened to your girls? You know, that was my earliest memory. And then like, boom, so much hair. I don't know what to do with it. Right. Yeah. Um, damn. Oh, well, thank you for sharing that story. <laughs> Thanks for asking. <laughs> I don't think I've ever told you on that. So look oh, at this is exclusive. I know, this is my therapy session. <laughs> I love the, the, the term hair depression because I think it validates a lot of people and their experiences and hair trauma. Right. Oh, yes. I've heard a lot of stories about people who mm -hmm. had processes done to their hair and it burned and their hair never grew back and they don't talk about it. They wear wigs, you know, instead. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but they would not, they would prefer not to, you know. So if you were treating someone and like hypothetically they had this and they wanted to learn how to like live healthier, to regrow their hair, to have healthier hair, what are some of the tips you would give them? Mm, great question. It's interesting. I actually came up with a term called aesthetic trauma, which is a deeply distressing or disturbing experience related to beauty. And also I've been working with theories around trauma-informed hair care. So you're definitely talking up my alley right now. Well, a major part is just similar to how we address trauma in general in terms of reauthoring stories, but also 
empowering people to make choices, for people to externalize that this is within a system of maybe patriarchy and bias or even white supremacy to contextualize some of the trauma they experienced related to their appearance. Why did their hair fall out while they were trying to straighten it and they used this chemical because they wanted to look like the girl in the commercial who had the really long straight hair. And so it allows um, people to explore why they initially maybe did some damaging practices to put it in, again, a societal lens so that they didn't have to own the, the experience. But again, there's a reauthoring piece in terms of who had choice or maybe the person didn't have choice. Because in a lot of my research studies, we found that mothers made these choices to chemically alter yes. or even burn yeah. with heat their children from a young age where they had hair loss. So going into owning, well, why did your mom do that? Well, she recognized that in this society to thrive and do well, you had to look a certain way. So kind of putting the layers of the story back together in a way that doesn't force anyone to have the ownership of how they ended up in a particular aesthetic trauma situation. Or their mothers you know, had a hard time yes. managing the hair, right? Because the curly hair, the natural hair, sometimes takes longer yes, to style, right? Yes, it does. Right? Hours so like, and hours. And if you have a lot of kids, it's like easier just to have it straight, right? So that's it another is. thing we don't think about, mm -hmm. too. Yeah, just even putting it in sort of a capitalist yeah. agenda in terms right. of if you spend so much time grooming yourself, yeah. then you're not working. We know that women of color, in particular around the globe, are such laborers. And so not having that slow life, right, in terms of being able to care for and groom, like in tradition, when we could have spent hours and hours caring for the hair of our children. Yeah, beautifully said. I, <laughs> I always ask my guests who are accomplished, who are dynamic like yourself, <laughs> what's a time in your life when on the outside you were doing so many things and people were just like, oh my gosh, you're doing so much, you're so great. You know, how do you do it all? Mm -hmm. And then you knew on the inside that it wasn't so easy. Actually, this is hard, you know, but people had no idea. And how did you get through it? Wow. Okay. I'm, I'm going to pull some recent examples. I had never been so popular up until the pandemic, right? In terms of now people are like, oh, mental health matters. Like, <laughs> duh, yes, it does. <laughs> and so being asked to speak at different Zooms and Instagram Lives and all these different things where the pace was so fast and I was still seeing my clients and still teaching classes and was staying up really late at night to catch up on writing and all these different things. To the point where in 2023, in April, I started feeling super nauseous, like all the time. I'm like, what is this? What did I eat that was bad? Or, you know, is did I get COVID? Is this long COVID? All these different things. And so it was so distressing because I was in this constant state of nausea. Nausea is like the worst feeling to have ongoing, but I'm still on the lives. I'm still seeing my clients. I'm still teaching classes, but like inside, like, let me pause for a second and walk away like, oh gosh, and then come back. And so it was to the point where I was ignoring that feeling and got super fatigued so that between each therapy client, I had to like take a nap oh. and come back on and see the next person. Until then, I'm, I'm traveling to speak at different places, but at the airport, I'm being pushed in a wheelchair because I'm so tired and fatigued. And so I would go to GI doctors. Oh, maybe it's acid reflux or IBS. I'm like, no, that's not what it is. Like, And, and I would take their medications, but wouldn't see any results. But it, I think it was stress. Yes. Like, And just even thinking about that relationship between our gut <laughs> and our mental health. And I, as a psychologist, mm -hmm. was completely ignoring it because of that pace of, oh, I have to share information. I need to impact. I need to demystify these things. But it was making me physically ill to sustain that lifestyle. So I ended up seeing a nutritionist and she prescribed this really clean diet of no processed foods, very, very limited sugar, only coming from fruits, lots of protein and things like that. And it actually was working in supplements and things like that and it actually settled my stomach. But then I realized in 
this lifestyle, I had to slow down to be able to cook the foods. Like it takes a while to make wild rice or <laughs> to yes, have to make these chickpeas and have to soak them so that it would was much of a slower process. So just like that hair care process, doing things slowly has a lot of benefits for the mind and the body. And then I learned transcendental meditation. And so this is a twice a day, 20 minute meditation. I had heard a quote years ago saying that everybody should meditate for 20 minutes a day. But if you're too busy, you should meditate for an hour. In terms of that <laughs> implication that because yes. of the busyness, you have to do way yes. more than what the average person is doing to then settle your nervous system. And so I'm so into like my soul nerve and my nervous system <laughs> now where I'm like, I cannot possibly be a good therapist if my nervous system is so dysregulated. And I noticed as I ate better, became more active, canceled speaking engagements, that my body found this equilibrium. And so it's working for the past few months. I even lost 30 pounds. Wow. Well, the processed foods, you're like, when, when someone <laughs> says don't eat any, you realize that it's really hard. Like yeah. there, there, are, there are very <laughs> few things that are not processed. And then what's all that added filler? Because... Hundreds of years ago, we weren't having these fillers. So what is this doing to us, you know, that increases inflammation? Yes. Right? Yes. And I'm really realizing now I'm like, oh, inflammation yes. is like connected to all these different diseases and even things that are preventable. I know in my family, I have all the major <laughs> inflammation or metabolic diseases, high blood pressure, hyper slash hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol. Like my parents, not to put them out yeah. there, but, and so I even noticed what can I do that's a little bit different so I don't have some of the health challenges. And so I'm the only person out of my parents and siblings, all of them, that's not on medication wow. for anything. Yeah. And so really like pausing, but I had to learn that the hard way. Well, you learned <laughs> it and thank you for sharing. You are just so incredible. I'm so fortunate that you came to be on the podcast because it's a great episode. Where can we learn about your upcoming book, your research? Where can we find you? Okay. So I do tend to stay on Instagram a lot. So you can find me at Dr. Afia, so D-R underscore A-F-I-Y-A, and at Psychotherapy. You can go to the website, psychotherapy.org. Org. I also have a private practice called Mayat Psychological Services. So Mayat is an Egyptian deity, a goddess of balance, order, truth, justice. And so that's the basis of mental health from this cultural framework. So Mayat Psychological Services.com and on Instagram. And where else can people find me? Those are the major ways, <laughs> websites and Instagram. And I have a new book coming out called Laid to the Side, which is an anthology of hair stories of Black women as they navigated hair and school. And so this can be a guide for next generations and to even process the feelings about Black beauty. Love it. <laughs> Can't wait to read it. It was so wonderful having you on. Thank, Thank you for you. having me. This was fun. <laughs>